Masters of the Universe, the textbook example of how cartoons can sell toys. Many Christmas lists during the mid-80s have the Masters of the Universe toys or she line on it. And right before the character went into a decade-long winter sleep, they tried to revamp him and keep him relevant for the 90s with He-Man Goes to Space. In this week's Ed's Retro Geek Out, we take a look at the new adventures of He-Man toy line. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and let's strap in for some toy history. Uh, He-Man for the 90s. In 1989, He-Man was introduced to toy stores. On one side, the heroic masters led by Prince Adam, and on the other side, the evil mutants kept under Skeletor's magic power. Out of the 10 action figures introduced, only He-Man and Skeletor sounded familiar, but they looked a bit off. What happened to the buffed up barbarian and his purple-blue skeleton nemesis? One left his steroids in the 80s, and the other got a cyborg update. Now all of this can be explained as Mattel was just following marketing research. In fact, a multitude of ideas came to the drawing board before they went with the He-Man Goes to Space team. First, they picked up where they left off. Masters of the Universe had a great couple years in the toy stores, but the demand for the toy line had become saturated. So much that the last line they had planned to be set in Preternia, the powers of Skull only partially saw release in the USA. And a couple more action figures were released in Europe where the toy line was still doing okay. This in combination with the live action movie that flopped put an end to the once successful toy line. Now there were still two ideas on the table. One was the hero, son of He-Man series for which a series bible was created in 88 but also revisited in 96. The focus would have been on the new character called Hero, the adopted son of He-Man, even though the name is the same as the He-Man's ancestor in the Powers of Grayskull toy line, these are two different characters. As this bible predates the new adventures, it does feature some concepts and characters that ended up in the new adventures. Son of He-Man would have seen Hero, the son of Tila, and He-Man on his adventures on the planet Primus, where he would have been sent as a baby when Eternia was in great danger. Hero would grow up on Primus and face an evil spawn called Skeletine, the son of Skeletor and Shadow Weaver. The series would have combined animation and some live action elements. Now creating a live action TV show was the other option. For this idea they would have needed character designs that would easily be translated with makeup and special effects on screen, but also the vehicles needed to be able to come to life on screen and still be cool in toy form. After all, at the end of the 80s, CGI or special effects isn't what it is now, and the live action movie proved that. As the movie mostly took place on Earth and with very few characters from the filmation cartoon. Too bad because the movie did gain cult status over the years, and Canon Films was already working on a sequel, Masters of the Universe 2 Cyborg. Then again, it was a critical and commercial failure, making only 17 million worldwide with a budget of 22 million to create the movie. At Mattel's HQ, they tried tried every iteration of He-Man. Rambo He-Man, Wrestler He-Man, Sports He-Man. There must have been 10 different versions on the drawing board. But thanks to some market research, a space adventure He-Man seemed to be the best option. They already knew they wanted to appeal to an international audience right away, taking into account that Master of the Universe was still selling well in Europe. Somehow, research showed that they needed smaller toys for the smaller European homes. During the development process, they didn't head into the archives for big gym molds like they did for the first series, but they went over to Japan to gain some inspiration for the toy line. Sente Creations Tokyo had them hooked on cool mechanisms, but fitting these into the smaller action figures proved to be a challenge. They fitted a new mechanism gimmick in almost all of them, but it was a serious task for the toy designers to make this happen. They were glad when a gimmick wasn't too complicated. Now the toy line started in 1989 when the first wave was introduced. Ten action figures, some vehicles and accessories, and the Starship Eternia playset. He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, is back. Travel through space and time, light years away from Castle Grayskull and Eternia into the future to fight the evil Lord Skeletor with the power of unique action features. 
E-Man and the Masters of Universe will be back right after these messages. And now back to He-Man. And that's when we met the new space hero and the cyborg Skeletor, who does bear some resemblance to the laser light Skeletor that was released in 88. The space sci-fi team had always been a part of Master of the Universe, and now they would play that card out to the max. In the first wave, He-Man was often packaged on a two-for-one card, where an evil mutant was added as a free extra to boost sales. But there was also a role-playing sword. Usually, role-playing swords and costumes were outsourced to third-party companies. However, for the power sword, they found a gimmick where it would react to movement and generate different sounds, so they kept that part of the role-playing merchandise for their own. Now around that time, a Mattel toy line needed to generate 20 million in sales to keep the toy line going for another year. And in the first year, the Power Sword on its own was able to generate that amount. When it came to promotion, they had the He-Man magazines in combination with the commercials on TV. One of which was a CGI rendered looking pretty okay for the time, but they also stuck to the classics, adding a cassette tape with the stories on them and the comics we all knew and loved from the first Master of the Universe line. For the new adventures, only four comics were created, but it's exactly here where we see a proper transition from the first line to the new line. As Hydro and Flipshot head back to the past, to barbarian times, to pick up He-Man, the hero, who will save their planet from the evil mutants, only to head back with both Prince Adam and Skeletor. In an epic battle aboard the spaceship that is now loaded with the power of Grayskull, Prince Adam grabs a new power sword and changes into the new He-Man. And finally, Skeletor finds out that Prince Adam was his nemesis He-Man all along. During the transformation, Skeletor is badly wounded, and when arrived in the future, he checks into his cyborg clinic to get some bionic replacements. Why not? The cool thing about these comics is that we actually go from the old style into the new. Cartoon-wise, Master of the Universe as well as the She-Ra cartoon was created by Filmation. However, in 1989, the company got taken over and shut down. But with both original cartoons still in heavy syndication, Mattel needed to capitalize on this with its new toy line, but it still needed a new cartoon to sell the toy line that was simply called He-Man. This brought them to Jetlag Productions, who worked with Japanese and Korean artists, and that's how it got more of an anime feel to it. From the first episode on, we see He-Man or Prince Adam in the new design style, so there's no checking back to the previous style of filmation. The cartoon consisted of one season worth of 65 episodes. It provided continuity over the different episodes, character development seemed to be more apparent, and the show touched on several topics not handled in the original or She-Ra cartoon. The end today's story segment at the end of the episodes was also scrapped. The toy line ended up lasting four years from 89 up to 92. Over four waves it featured some new characters from both sides of the battle in addition to the 10 of the first wave. Nordor, the planet where Skeletor and his evil aliens would reside, was also turned into a playset. The planet would open up, revealing a playing field on different platforms. Now, one of my favorite toys released in this line has got to be Optic, who originated as a sketch for the first toy line, but was reimagined to fit within New Adventures. The eye movement gimmick was designed by David Wolfram, who had also implemented it on the Boglins Mattel toy line. Most of the figures at the Space Team and Metal resemble plastic applied. For the vehicles, some were created to walk on land, but you couldn't really make a space age He-Man without some spaceships. The vehicles consisted mostly of flying pots, and the biggest one was also a transforming playset. The spaceship Eternia is a massive space vessel consisting of different parts you can join together to create your own version of the space station. You had the main control pod that could fly on its own, a sound and lights battery operated unit, and then and the spaceship interior panels and tunnels to connect the different parts depending on which version of a playset you wanted to make. They also tried to expand on the role-playing success of the Power Sword. With the Skull Staff and in the last wave the Terror Punch and Thunder Punch were introduced. However, the sales for these were way lower. Like the original toy line, they would also create variants for the most popular characters, but they would also alter the He-Man back to his roots. By wave 2, Battle Punch He-Man was once again pumping iron and stuck to his fitness regime till the end of the wave with the Thunder Punch
launch He-Man released in 1992. Discs of Doom and Battleblade Skeletor would see the Cyborg Skeletor team expand, and Hydron and Flipshot would get their variant upgrades as well. The end result of the toy line concluded that they tried too soon to revamp the IP, leaving most of the new adventure's toys sent overseas to Europe. And when sales didn't keep up, they had to shut down the line. But not all the toys on the drawing board got onto shelves, there's still some unproduced concepts. Darius was announced in the 1989 Mattel catalog for Europe. He played a pivotal role in the new adventure storyline, but in the end he didn't go into production. This was due to a complication of the action feature, which they couldn't get to work correctly on the final prototype. But it hasn't stopped Masters of the Universe customizers to create the leader of the Galacta Council for hardcore new adventure toy fans. The Galactamites and the Gleenons made it into the 1991 catalog, but were never seen on the shelves. KO was a variant that didn't make it past Raisin Stage, and a prototype for Maura was only made at the end of the line. They had targeted the line to boys, so no female characters ended up in toy stores. Even though from the beginning, Mara had a big role in the series, being Master Cebrian assistant as well as the love interest for Prince Adam. The Mara prototype is based on a new costume they gave her at the end of the cartoon series. She came with her hair maze gimmick, as a toy could be wound up to spin around her waist, damaging her surroundings. There was also some artwork uncovered by Errol McCarthy that never made it into prototype form as they were drawn, although some are thought to have been early sketches of later released characters. Too bad because this monster mount arena play set would have definitely gotten my imagination going. And I would have loved to have seen this robotic Skeletor with the crazy red hair. Now these days there's not a lot of talk going around about the new adventures He-Man. But there's still some fun toys and characters in the line. We would actually see several characters make a comeback in the Masters of the Universe Classics line as an homage. In 2001, New Adventures was followed by the 2000X line where the Four Horsemen Studios took the E-Man toy line to the next level sculpt-wise. But that's a story for another episode. You have the power to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on any new videos. If you want to support the channel, you can always leave a like, leave a comment, or share this video to a toy fan buddy. If you want to do more, you can always check out my Patreon. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!